morning, everyone. Morning. Um, so somewhere in the room is I have a mailing list. If anyone, I went around, but if you don't, if you didn't sign up, if you'd like to, please do. Um, also, at any time when I'm talking, if you have questions, just feel free to let me know. Usually, people have questions even before I begin to talk. So. Um, Okay, so in my early 20s, I had a near-death experience, the thing like you see in a movie where I was going out of my body into the white light and seeing my body leaning against a tree. I was in a very bad car accident, that, and if you were to see the car after, you'd be surprised that anyone survived. Um, I, in doing that, it, it wasn't actually going into the light because it was being in this, in this white light and just sort of floating. And the, the biggest impression that I left, that I got from that was just knowing how everything is okay. Um, and I often joke around and then I heard a voice say, you have to go back, your father wants you to stay. And so I said, okay, and went back into my body. And the joke is if I knew how different it was here compared to there, I don't know if I would have gone back into my body because it was this feeling of it, just everything is okay beyond what I experience a lot in the physical world. Okay. Um, the biggest effect that it had on my life was I started meeting people everywhere that had near-death experiences. And I started meeting people that did a lot of studying and spiritual disciplines, is Islam, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism. Uh, those are the things that come to mind right away. Um, but I was very surprised over the years that I did end up meeting a lot of people. And it's funny because a friend of mine who's been a friend for close to 10 years, once in a while it's crossed my mind like this is unique because this person never had one of these experiences. And about two weeks ago, they said, told me an experience they had. It wasn't a near-death experience, but when they were young, they would have out-of-body experiences. When they were lying in bed, their spirit or whatever would go up on the ceiling and see her body down below. And I thought, wow, no wonder, you know, and it was kind of interesting like that. Um, so I'll just tell you some of the, um, part of what happened after that, I started to notice when I would touch people that my hands became very warm and they started to tell me how nice that felt and you know they would feel things healing in their body. That was a big difference I noticed. Also I had a, uh, my next door neighbor growing up, this was, I was good friends with the son, but this was the father. His, his father was sick and close to dying and I said to him, I'll pray for your father and I did and I felt something happen when I did that. And this guy came back to me and said, you're, I think your prayers helped because his father went from seeming like he was gonna be passing away soon to not. And that was a very cool thing. And so then I met this guy, Rashad, and he was a Sufi sheikh. And Sufism is part of the Islamic tradition. I was brought up in a Jewish family, so, but I felt very attracted to this man in a way of I just needed to know what he knew. And uh, he introduced me to some of the magical things that I've experienced since. Um, he right away started playing this funny joke on me because anytime I asked him anything, he would say, you don't need to know that. Mm -hmm. And I asked him a lot of things. He kept saying, you don't need to know that. At some point he said to me, I'm not really your teacher. And he said, but we'll find you someone. I had no idea who he meant by we or anything like that um, years later. So in the, the Sufi tradition, it was the Mevlevi dervishes. And a lot of people know of Jalaluddin Rumi, Rumi the poet. And even though people read his poems like their love poems, as far as I know, all his poems are written about his relationship with God or his relationship with his spiritual teacher. So when I was, um, some years later that I was still studying with this guy Rashad, I, a friend of mine said, oh, you need to come meet this other 
person. And I did a reading, <coughs> you would do readings in the Mathnawi, which is a, like a six volume book that Jalaluddin Rumi wrote, and there's a way to so I intuitively choose a reading. And it was very cool because my friend was saying, you need to go on these discourses. So I opened up the book. Normally they're very, they're in stories. So they're not always so direct in how they answer. But in this one, it was very clear. The story said, it talked about discourses and it said, you need to listen to these discourses with your spiritual ear instead of, it said your corporal ear, meaning your physical ear and you, sh you need to go meet the person who's writing them. And it just, it was so perfect because my friend was saying, I'll, she bought me a ticket to go to uh, Virginia to meet this guy. And um, so he was another very magical person. One of the very cool things that happened with Rashad, um, I sort of like the stories that don't have, I've experienced some miraculous healing uh, stories, but this is not a necessarily a healing thing, but it's kind of a fun, cute story. So I was getting married at the time, and Rashad married us, and he told me, go get nine uh, closed roses. And I said, okay. I didn't know what they were for, but so the ceremony ended up being, he had the nine roses, he said, put your hands out, he put one of the roses in my hand, he said, one stands for unity, and then I put that rose in my wife's to be at that time hands, and he added another one in saying twos for I don't remember what he said each number was, but it went back and forth till I had nine roses in my hand. Then he said, "Drop the roses in this bowl of water that was there." And as I did, all the roses opened up, the room filled with the fragrance of roses. And then he said, "Taste the water," and it had turned to rose water. So a very magical, fun story. Right? Um, something that happened recently that is my own healing work that I do. Um, someone found me on Facebook. I think this person lives in London. And even though I work on the phone all the time with people not with me physically, it seems extra cool when they're very far away. So she was in London and she said, I need your help, blah, 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 this is going on. And so I told her how much I charge and she said, I can't afford that. So I went inside, I figured, you know, what was the least amount that she could pay that she would be doing her part in the process, which is very important. So I told her an amount. She said, I can't afford that. A few minutes later, she came back and she said, I'll send you the money right away. She sent it and, you know, I felt something start to shift too. I don't always have control over what happens. And she said, wow, it feels like my irregular heartbeat shifted. And she went to the doctor after to confirm that. So that was a ver another very cool thing. Um, one time I was talking, again, on the f I mostly work on the phone. This woman actually met her in a social situation. So she really wasn't looking for any healing, but she started to talk to me that she had arthritis. And I, I wonder now what she'd be diagnosed with. It was some years ago, but she basically had aches and pains through her whole body and she's been trying to heal it, and she was a nurse. Um, and we were talking on the phone, and I saw spiritually that there was an American Indian guide with her. And, you know, when people talk to me a lot, they're talking and talking, and I listen to them, but it's sometimes just to be polite, so they're, you know, I don't want to just interrupt them and say, no, this is what I see, but, so then I said to her, you have this American Indian healing guide with you, and I could tell by her tone of voice she was kind of afraid. And she said, yes, I'd been to someone else who told me the same thing. I said, but you don't understand. This guide or whatever you call it is there to help you. And she, I could hear in her tone of voice. I could see what I see spiritually. And things shifted. And she goes, wow, the pain's out of my body. And it was like that. Another very cool thing. Um, any questions at this time? What's it? Pardon me? Uh, I came in late. Are you talking about near death? Well, I had a near death experience. I'm talking about the effects that it had on me after. So. Uh, I don't know if it's time for me to talk yet. Um, Go ahead, sure. Well, um, I had 
I had an experience after I had surgery once. Yes. My body was floating above. Right. I'll never forget it in my whole life. My body came out of my body and I was floating. That's, a, that's what happened to me too. When I was, I could see my body. I was in a bad car accident and the police had pulled me out and I could see my body there and a policeman kneeling over me and um, then well, I, stuff happened. I was in the hospital and I asked the nurse, did I die? Yes. And um, I'll never forget it. Did, they, was, did, they, did, well, I, I did the nurse say that you died? Body, yeah. And I was floating. Well, that reminds me because has anyone else in here had similar experiences to that? Just wondering. And after that, I was very spiritual. Yeah, that's what happened to me. That's so cool. So I was telling the story about Rashad. I found out after the fact that he had a near-death experience, and he had like a group of people that he taught, and a lot of people in there did. And it seems you connect. Some people have more... Uh, descriptive experiences during that time. For me, I was just floating in this white light that just felt so good, and I just had this wisdom in my, you know, in my heart and in my mind. Okay. Um, so sometimes people say they meet their relatives and things like that. Uh, that didn't particularly happen to me. Um, and I do in my description of this talk, I said that my near-death experience was the beginning of my spiritual journey, but really it was more like a kick in the butt to recognize what had happened. Uh, some years before that, I was in the movies in New York City, and I saw this person, and I didn't even know what to make of it at the time. My grandfather had passed away a few years before that, um, and he was a unique-looking person, so it would be very unlikely that he was like six foot four, you know, more than 300 pounds, and he always wore a super nice suit and a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, which is kind of unique, but back then it was even more unique. You know, cowboy stuff is sort of in style soon. So I saw him sitting in the front row of the movie theater, and it's like I was like, whoa, what, you know, and I just left because I didn't even know what to do. I was with my brother. I said, did you see, we called him Pop in the front row. He said no, and I just let it go, and... Um, but after my near-death experience, I did start meeting a lot of people that were spiritual teachers and healing teachers. And as I said, I started to feel the thing in my hands. So my, when I first started, I was learning to do hands-on healing work. Um, after I was married, I was in a minor car accident. Um, and I didn't feel like I was injured from the car accident at all. But the next day, my shoulder and lower back were really hurting. And it felt more stress-related. It was just super tight. So I went to Vermont to visit a friend. And he suggested that I try a polarity treatment. And I didn't really know what that was at the time. But I went to this woman, and she did polarity. And polarity is a very gentle type of body work, similar to what people would think of as acupressure, but very gentle. So you're more like holding points. It's based on uh, Ayurvedic medicine from India as opposed to from China or Japan like acupuncture, acupressure is. Um, so I went, during that time I had a great healing. I had a lot of flashbacks to my childhood. I got off the table feeling really good, and, but I was actually going to complain because she said it was going to be about an hour and it felt like way less than that. I, before I did, I looked at the clock. I was actually on the table for three hours. Right, so these, cool, th these little cool things are like, you know, kind of cool. And um, so she said you should follow up on this, and she happened to know someone who lived near I did, where I did at the time. And um, so I started getting sessions from her, and she said, you know, I'm starting a class. I think that you would like, enjoy it. And I did, and I started to discover that I was very sensitive to what goes on with people energetically. This is the second time that people don't seem to have a lot of questions right away, so I didn't really prepare that much speaking because normally the questions just take over. Um, 
Yes. It's no question. Yes. I have not had these experiences myself, but I have talked to, have some friends who have had such experiences. Yeah. And uh, one is a very close friend who uh, had childbirth, and a few days later she hemorrhaged, and she was losing a lot of blood. She was back in the hospital, and she felt like she was entering that warm light mm -hmm. yeah and she felt that she was being welcomed and yes all sense of fear was totally gone she felt drawn to the place and she felt like she was safe and being welcomed and she wanted to go and then her husband walked into the hospital room and she said, oh no, I can't leave him alone with a new baby. <laughs> and she just yeah. came back to her body. But she said ever since then, she has totally no fear of dying anymore. That's, that's what a lot of people say. I'm not so much in that category, but it, there's, but I can see when you're talking about it, you sort of connect into it some. And that's the thing that I've learned is, how to connect into that energy or consciousness, whatever you feel, however you describe it, plus I've learned how to help other people do that. So. Yes? I went to a talk with a yellow once, uh -huh. and um, she was going on, and all of a sudden she looks at me and she said, you have ability, you are a healer. <laughs> now, I've always felt connected to things, and I've certainly a hundred, uh, six, 360 degrees in my life, yeah. but I don't feel, I don't have any of the sensations and real things that you're doing. Yeah. Is there a way to get Yes, that? yeah. So, I, for, so we have basically three major centers, or one's in our head, in our heart, and in our gut. Okay, so if you breathe into your heart a little bit, the, there's the tricky part is not to try to identify it so much. So I have a saying that I heard, if you can put your finger on it, it's not it. Which sometimes gets people frustrated, but your, your skill might be in something that you don't relate to as healing. Okay? So I'm, when I'm talking to you, there's... I, I mean, I just start to see things, because it... it um, so there, you could definitely do that, but breathe into your heart a little bit more. You have some hurt in there. And most people do. What's that? Yeah, that's cool. So just breathe in. You can even put your hand in the center of your chest there. And then just focus in there and you'll see things will start to shift. Okay, so you have some, I mean, there's like some animal spirits with you. And so there's cool things. So you could do that. It, there are meditations and things. The best way is actually to have sessions with me. That goes the quickest and the least amount of work for people. Okay. Yes? I've been a hospice volunteer. Well, I don't drive anymore, so I don't do visitation except where I'm living now. Yeah. But my deceased husband and I had something going between us that we were able to connect with a dying person. That's cool, yeah. And in fact, one of my last experiences <laughs> With my husband, this lady was just about on her way out. Yeah. And he whispered to her, Would you like to go dancing tonight? <laughs> if you know Walter, that's a Walter's thing, right? She snapped up. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And then the nurse said, I've never seen anything like this. She was on her way out. Yeah. And while we were there, she passed. Wow, that's, yeah, those so are great the nurse stories. said, what an experience this lady had. Yeah. Would you like to go dance? <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun saying. And the, yeah. Well, when things line up spiritually, they just shift like that. It doesn't always happen like that, but sometimes, it, sometimes we need to show the spirit that we're serious about it because of 
things that have happened earlier in our lives or in other lifetimes. But that's cool. And so I've had a lot of experiences like that, some that I've facilitated and some that other people have. Very, very cool. So there seems yes. to be a lot of commonality with these near-death, out-of-body experiences. Yes. A light, warmth, yes. welcoming, good feelings. Is that universal? Or this sometimes is the exact opposite? So I've heard of some that are the exact opposite that happen, but not that many. And um, so I don't, you know, obviously I've only, I mean, I belong to groups online of people that talk, but most people say the positive things. One thing, I mean, for me, some people seem to just be really balanced and happy their whole life. I'm not one of those people. So I have normal ups and downs things in my life that go on and it always, but there's always that choice of, do I get caught up in the world or connect into the spiritual part? And, you know, that's in every tradition. So whether it's being mindful or meditating and connecting into spirit, there's that choice of getting caught up in the negative things. And, you know, you have to make a living and clean your house and all those things. So that always goes on. Any other? Yes. So does that mean that people who have a positive experience um, is going to heaven and people who uh, don't are probably going no. the other way? No. There's... It's, people talk about that, and there, to tell you the truth, in, after people die, there's not really a hell. It's not quite like that. There are many different levels. There, people can sort of, what I call, access into a level of hell more when they're physically alive. And, you know, when you're really fretting about something and it's almost beyond what the situation really warrants, you might be connecting into that. There's... You know, everyone has that positive thing inside of them. I refer to it as a soul, but depends on your belief what that is. But everyone has that really good thing. And I, uh, so there are different levels. So I, none of them really are what, like burning in hell that you're possibly referring to. When I ended up writing my doctoral treatise about a breathing exercise, and I sort of started to do that because I, after 10 years of, going back and forth, what should I write about, and getting into one thing or another, I figured this would be simple and I'd sort of cheat the system really. But it ended up being really quite profound. But one of the things I entertained for a while was quantum physics. So you're talking about, and that's a scientific thing that we know that our thoughts affect the subatomic particles. And this is something that's proven as much as there's a wall there. Um, one of the things that I read about that I thought was, again, these things are mind-boggling and very cool. Someone proposed, could we ever know if subatomical particles are moving or not without when we're not observing them? So a lot of quantum physics are designed, experiments are designed to try to trick the subatomic particles into thinking we're not watching them, but we don't know if we're really tricking them. So in that way, what we're thinking, what we're saying, what we're doing, affects things subatomically. And that is a very profound, cool thing where it, it takes these spiritual things we're talking about. There is proof of near-death experiences and life after, but it's not the same as the wall. It's not a solid thing. So there's always, well, there's always room for doubt in there. Okay. So it's, in, yeah. it's interesting that the quantum physics aspects, you are healing at an energy level yes. that is tapping into consciousness that, that you yeah. can heal other people because everything is vibration. Everything, everything is, is vibration. Energy. So when we look at the subatomic particles, things are vibrating like that. And so in my treatise, I wanted to keep things as scientific as possible because there are a lot of, even when I went I go to the University of Bridgeport like once a year and do some classes and the woman there is a yoga teacher who sets it up and she and she keeps trying to talk about breathing in the yogic way and a lot of people just they you know they get this glazed uh, look in their eyes that they don't want to hear about it but what I did was wanted to get real scientific research so it's and I did that it w took a lot of patience and determination 
And in the beginning of my research, there was something on NPR.org. I thought, oh, this is a reputable source with a liberal point of view like I have. And the guy wrote an article saying people successfully use breathing as a way to recover more quickly from surgery. And he quoted a study and so, but I wanted to find the study. So I looked in the study. The study actually said the opposite of what he used the quote to say. The study said, no way, it doesn't work at all. He used a quote from that study. So I learned to be very diligent in my research and I'm glad I did that. So I have concrete evidence um, for people who don't really believe in this type of thing. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you. You can't for consciousness. We all are conscious. Yes. So when somebody does have a near death experience, yes. do you believe that they actually have the choice whether to stay or go, or do you believe that when it's your moment, it's your moment? Um, that's a good question. I think perhaps some people do, but a lot of people that I've communicated with have a similar experience to me. Like, they didn't really have a choice and it, they were supposed to come back. So, I don't know, you know, it's... Um, so I did start studying, at the time people didn't talk about near-death experiences, but I started studying death, like uh, reading books that one of, I guess a well-known one is the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, um, but learning about, and the, learning how to be prepared and be more, putting more of your consciousness in that place that we talk about, like in, the, in heaven or in the higher levels of spirit. So when you do transition, that you're more prepared, basically. So I would like to think you could, but I, you know, it's, it does seem, well, when I work with people, people, I call it karma, people have karma. They're just gonna, there's certain things, and it, it's usually not so specific. I talk about it like a four-lane highway, but it's more like a hundred-lane highway. So you're sort of moving in a certain direction, but you have a lot of choices within that direction. Sometimes in this type of thing, people say, oh, everything's perfect. Everything is perfect, but there's a lot of other choices that are perfect too. A lot of times there doesn't need to be quite so much suffering. There, there's part of us that wants to learn our life lesson so much that it sort of overdoes creating the, the lesson, the situation necessary for the lesson. So, and what I do is I can, someone described it this way years ago, is like it's a file with a hundred papers in there, we really only need three or four. And what I do gets rid of those other papers. It's a nice way to look at it. What do you think you're, you have a time and all that stuff or, I mean, well, so I'm, I'm just, so another person that I know would say, how do, you know, people would ask him, how do you know if it's karma? And he said, Basically, if it's the same thing's happening over and over again, or if something is happening in your life and you don't want to be there, that's karma. So I do think, I, I think we have a choice, but I don't know if we have t total choice. Some people say if you have total, you know, free will, let's say you fly, or let's say you manifest a million dollars there on the floor, and <laughs> most people can't do that. So. You're welcome. How do you define karma? Very yeah. please. How do you define karma? How do you define karma? Um, well, the way that I define it is that thing that we have that is, um, I don't just define it as bad things. So a lot of times people talk about karma like bad things that happen, but I think there's something, it, it's more like our life lesson or things that we're born with that is just part of our life, okay? and. Um, I don't know why this comes to mind. I have two children, very different in age, 25 years apart, different mothers, and there are certain words they say the same that neither I or either of their mothers do with a certain accent. I can't even think of the word. So with my daughter, she's the younger one, she's 14, I kept, she says certain words that I thought, wow, where does that accent come from? You know, it's like, it's not like from... You know, it's from this, generally this area, but it's different than her mother or I, or any, you know. 
And then I kept wondering about it. Then one day I'm with my son and he said the same word. I go, wow, how did that happen? You know, and so that's sort of the clue in there. Okay. There's also a part of it that everyone has something really good and valuable in them. That is part of what I call karma. Um, and a lot of, well, when I work with people, I can see that. So what I do is I see that person and it's sort of like there's a line and it's this very good thing and there's a very good place they can be. And then I can sort of see what's blocking it. I don't always know what that karma is, but sometimes when I talk to people I know. Um, years ago I had this client, she came to me, as a lot of people do, their friends sort of pushed them to, um, and she was very depressed on medication, not doing very well at all, and you know, it ended up her story as she was, fell in love with this guy who wasn't, he wasn't a mean guy, but he, was not very loyal, let's say. And he would just, he loved to flirt with all sorts of women. And um, So her friend was telling her, her psychologist, her psychiatrist was telling her, you need to get away from this guy. And I could see whatever it is that I call karma, and it might not be the same as everyone, that she didn't, this is not usually the case for people. So, um, but she, it was way easier for her to be happy, let's say, with this guy than not, and she probably wouldn't have been. So I said, you need to change your strategy, come up with a plan, stop whining, and get this guy. And they're married, living in California now, and she's much happier. So um, I don't know if I use karma the same as everybody, but I don't look at it as a negative thing. I think even our skills, like people ask me about this, can anyone do this? Anyone can but I can do it better than most people. And it's the same as an athlete, a professional athlete. Anyone can play baseball or football, but not anyone, but most people, but you know, the people that are really good at it or making money, you know, being an artist. My son's an artist and he puts out these amazing pieces of art. I can hardly draw anything, you know, so like that. Any atheists that have had out-of-body experience? Yes, but as far as I know, they something changes in them. Uh, so, but I have, like I said, I belong to these groups online of near-death experience people, because there is a certain connection. But it's it's like anything. I used to bicycle a lot, and there was a connection with the other bicyclers also. So it's you like to have those commonalities. Yes. What is the connection between near death experience and what you do and feel? And could you tell us some of the things you do in your profession of this? Yes. Um, the connection is that, I mean, that's a good question. People are always trying to describe it. I tend to, one thing that I've learned is in order to do the thing we're talking about, which is sort of to see into what I experienced during the near-death experience, you want to hold your mind back, okay? So this guy, I've always been told, you don't need to know that. And it's, that's not true without anyone, but I know that not knowing something, you're much more open to learning. I you know, think of, like when I go on vacation to a new place, I meet new friends right away. At home, I normally don't, because I'm you know, going to my friends. So, um, I just knew, know that after that I started to have, and it's not that I didn't have any of that before, but it really amplified my ability to sense what's going on with people, intuitively know things. Um, what I do mostly is I work on the phone with people and I counsel them, but it, part of it is I do, when I work with people I see this thing in them that's really good, I see this place that they can connect to that's they're not quite doing that. That's sort of a, a supply of this positive energy. Plus, then there'll be specific things they need to do in their life. And I can see what's blocking them, either in their consciousness or things that happened in this lifetime. And then there's ways of just sort of asking and asking in a way that's not very specific because my mind um, and anyone's mind has an idea of what healing would be for someone and it could be something different. Okay. So. 
Jeannie, did you have something to say? You raised well, your hand. Well, I had to, I'm not sure if you want to hear what I have to say. Yes. But when my oldest brother died, yeah. I, when I, oh, when my oldest brother died, I felt him dying in my sleep. Yeah. At the exact time that he died, that I felt happens. him leave. Yeah. So I, when my mother was sick in the hospital the last few days, I didn't want to go visit her because I knew she was waiting for, for me to go see her. So, and I put it off for a few days and I knew, you know, that wasn't the right thing to do. So I went there and talked to her and it was, it was nice to know that because I completed some things with her and I said to her, don't worry, I'm grown up. She said, you're never going to grow up. And <laughs> But I said, well, but I know how to take care of myself, and that is kind of true. And then I left, and, and she was a very, she, uh, I don't even know what word to put on it, but when I told her I was going to visit her, she said, wait, I need to put my makeup on and stuff before, and she wouldn't, you know, I would have stayed with her if I thought she would have let herself pass away when I was there, but she was, you know, in that kind of old-fashioned in that way. And so, but shortly, after I left, she passed away. So, um, and I've had other, I had a friend who passed away a few years ago and I had a dream at night that he was passing away and he was saying something to a friend of mine and it, I had that dream right the night he passed away and my friend said he had a similar experience where he was being told something. That was very cool. Yes? You can just tell me, I'll repeat the question in here. Okay. Um, one was when my mother was dying. Yes. The batteries dying. Okay. So when my mother was dying, I went and spoke with her. The, and um, I, you know, said a lot of things to her, but she was not conscious. Physically. Yeah. She couldn't speak. Or yes. Anything. And when um, John and I left, she died like an hour later. And it really got that feeling too. She was very, she was very uh, shy about it. Yeah. In the end, so she wouldn't die while we were there. Yeah, that's. Um, you I used to. A lot of my practice used to be with people that were about to pass away, and there was this man. He was a pretty well-known psychologist. He because he had written some books that are standards in people studying psychology in college, and. He was a very serious, not very friendly person, and he had got a brain tumor. And as he got sicker, he became the most loving, gentle man. And then he didn't. He had a, a living will where he didn't want to be, you know, any medical treatment at a certain point. Um, so he was in his family's home, basically lying in a bed in the living room. And I would look, you know, observe him from like the doorway, and there was this beautiful white light all around him. And it was kind of cool, but any time one of his family members came in who was really stressed, that white light would go away and they would bring in this very dark energy. So, cool things. Yes? Other question is, I don't know if I believe you can do uh, counsel people by phone. Yeah. I just never believe that. I thought that you needed to be right next to the person because their energies and your energy would be yeah. There's certain things that are actually easier over the phone because you don't have to deal with their physical energy. Um, I just, I know what you mean. Before I knew how to do this, I would think it was so ridiculous and uh, I was a very scientific, straight-laced person. I have a client now, a regular client, who's in Australia and I think that's particularly cool because it's so far away, plus sometimes it's a different day than it is here when I talk to her. That's great. So, yes? What were your major findings in your doctoral work on breathing? Um, well, I developed this breathing exercise that it... Uh, oh, you asked about the major findings in my doctoral treatise on breathing. Um, that, I guess, again, to me, some of these things are just awesome, and I hate to use these words, but I don't know how else to describe them, but one of the studies I found that was done at Harvard 
this was on mindfulness. And mindfulness is basically spending time focusing on your breathing. It's not adjusting your breathing usually at all, but just so when something emotional comes up, you go back to focusing on your breathing. But this study, I liked it because they used scientific method, which was take MRIs of the people's brain before the eight-week study and after. And their, the gray matter in their brain grew. So basically, when the gray matter grows, it just becomes more dense. And to me, that's like, wow, that's a really cool thing. So focusing on your breathing, um, the reason I looked up, inform tried to find that information, not that specifically, but I was noticing, like I do things online, like if I try to access my Yahoo email after a time of not doing it, it'll send me this six number, you know, number, and I have to put that, and it, you know, I was finding when I was doing my study that I was able to remember those numbers e more easily. So I thought, wow, I wonder if doing the breathing had an effect on my mental abilities. So I found a lot of information about that. But it increases the oxygen in your body. Uh, for athletes, their muscles don't get as tired. There was a, one of the women in the study helped her menstrual cycle tremendously. So, um, yeah, there were just, there's so much information, but real information, not just, oh, it feels good type of thing. So, yeah. so Edgar Casey is a good example that is of the thing of holding your mind back. Because people want to take what Edgar Casey did and then do that exact thing, but there's so many variables. Like if someone talks to me, oh, I have this wrong, can you help me? And, you know, it's, well, first of all, I can help almost everybody. It's just a matter of time. But there, the way we look at things in Western medicine is very different than Eastern medicine. So there's, um, like in Eastern medicine, there's like you look at the whole picture. Like if you're looking at a beautiful piece of art, you don't need to look at every little thing. Like there could be, like the, there's this book, The Web That Has No Weaver, that describes it really well. And I don't even remember what painting it is, but in, it's a famous painting. And in there, there's a wheelbarrow with a broken wheel. And you don't look at it and go, oh, there's, the wheelbarrow's broken. You look at the painting. So in the Eastern medicine, it's more like that. You look at the whole picture. And everyone has this good thing. Everyone has something really good they can do, and it's just a matter of finding that. And, you know, you're talking about you don't know what it is. It could be, I mean, I've learned a lot of this when I was young through playing basketball. Okay, my father was an electrical contractor. The electricians, some of them were like, they could fix things. Like, it was during a time when things were not computerized at all, but they were starting to be. And these old timers would go in and fix these computerized things with no education whatsoever. Like they just had that thing. There's, like I said, people with money, some people just make the money. So it could be, some, it could be cooking, it could be whatever it is. I have a client, it, she's looking for a thing and her thing is really being a mother. And she's so happy about that. But she wasn't feeling very rewarded with that because she was like, oh, it has to be a job or, you know, something different than that. Okay. Okay, the microphone is back in business. I have to apologize. Yay. A spare back there, there, there also. There's someone back there, a new person who hasn't Super. gotten a chance. Great, thank you for pointing that out. So I'm curious, do you use uh, any... I have a pretty microphone. That's a... We want to get it there. So. Thank you. Uh, do you use complementary tools or modalities to accentuate the energy healing that you're doing? For instance, gemstones or chakra knowledge? Um, any of the above, and if so, how do you determine when to use that as a complementary tool to help heal your clients? Yes, I use all sorts of things. Uh, mostly it's just sort of a knowing at this point, but uh, one thing I learned when I was starting was how to use a pendulum. Uh, in my doctoral program, we learned applied kinesiology. But I have a book like this of can use acupuncture points, chakra points, and they're talking about chakras. There's different traditions that talk about chakras differently. And it's, you just sort of go in your mind. You, again, you hold your mind back. This information starts to come, and you wait. And so your mind's here. It's like, oh, I, I know what that is. No, you don't know. You wait, and you wait, and you wait. And that's like, oh, I see what that is. So there's, um, it could be anything like that. Okay, so I don't actually use 
crystals, but there was a time in my practice when I had an office in the city that I did. I actually put the crystals. So. But we're looking for the, everything has a frequency. A lot of times colors is a big thing. And I'll, you either, sometimes it'll, sound. What's, sound, that's not something I use so much, but yes. So one of the people I studied is Gurdjieff, and he was very into sound. And it's just kind of cool because it has a certain frequency. But the colors, sometimes I'm working with people and it just, all of a sudden the room fills with the color. It's really cool when the other person says the same thing. Sometimes that happens. So. But uh, I do body work also that sometimes I see people in person. So there's some people that I see after a long time of working with them. And it's kind of interesting to see. So. Yes? I'm not exactly sure how to ask this question. Okay. Maybe too abstract also. Well, this is all very abstract. I'm really good at somehow talking about it, so that's good. So, what is your theory or understanding or hypotheses about the relationship between our material world and the spiritual world? That is a big question. We could talk about that forever, but um, it, well, it actually it varies with different people. So, there's part of... Um, so we have different parts of our consciousness and there's parts of it that's always very lined up with our spiritual part. But sometimes people are very disconnected from that. And it, it, you know, it's, to me, it's one of the saddest things, especially if someone doesn't realize how off they are. You know? And I see, um, you know, if someone's sick in a certain way, they're, whether it's mentally or physically, they're aware of that. You know? And sometimes people just get locked into these patterns that are... Um, and, you know, in one way, everything is spiritual. So it depends on what level you're looking at, but it's part of their lesson to learn that. Um, I mean, my experience is when I work with people, the spiritual part comes more present and starts to heal them. And that's, you know, even that you're asking a question and I'm trying to answer it, but what I say in a certain way doesn't matter that much. So... Uh, Again, one of my friends used to say, you could just say ham and eggs, ham and eggs. And he thought that was the funniest thing, but it's true. Things start to line up with people. And that spiritual part is what's really cool. And, you know, there's no way to prove what I say of most of it, but most people go, wow, that feels way better. And especially when it's something physical or someone's ill, you know. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. But I do think everyone has a soul, and there's been very few people in history that their soul is just not there. So, and you would know they're famously bad people. So, okay. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Sure. You have related a lot of success stories. Yes. Are there also failures when it doesn't work? Yes. Uh, I haven't had that many, which is kind of good. Um, well, you know, you, there's... I always see something shifting, so it's more about the person. I'll tell you, okay, so one time I treated, and this is a famous person, I'm not going to say their name, but they had a session with me, and during, this was in person, and um, they were... They said, wow, there's so much energy moving through my body. I feel so good. And I mean, it, it was very cool what I was seeing and what the person was experiencing. And then, like a day or two later, they were saying nothing happened. And it was like, what? Like, so it was kind of, thing. so sometimes that happens where people, um, the thing I also mentioned about paying, there's people need to put something in, and usually that's in the form of money. Um, so sometimes I've seen people, again, I see things changing, um, and then whether, I, I don't know what it is, and some people less changes. I had this thing a while ago, this woman called me, as someone referred her to me, and she was having problems. She was about to get married, and her husband, you know, basically the day before the wedding left, and just didn't want anything to do with her. And I talked to her and I could see, you know, there were things going on with her that cleared up and with him. And I thought, oh, good, you know, everything's going to be better. <clears throat> I contact, a lot of times after the first session, I contact people in a, 
the next two or three days because sometimes people actually have like a healing reaction where they don't feel that well and it's easy to fix and sometimes it's just because they haven't drinking enough water but she basically I thought she was gonna because what happened during the session I thought she was gonna be like oh I'm so happy he called me the next day we're getting married and she just said yeah I'm okay and I'm like really like I was surprised but then a couple of weeks later she sent me an email saying oh I'm so happy thank you so much we're back on track we're getting married again and so are there times people say they didn't feel anything? Yes. I can only think of three times over the years that I've done it, and it's not really much more than that. So that's good. Yes? I think the dynamic of healing is such that there, the predicate has to be, there has to be a firm belief on the other side. Uh, uh, that's so not, in, on some level it does. So again, I have stories. So this young man who was in his early 20s was a client of mine and his father was very suspicious and um, so his father came this I had an office in Connecticut and he came there and his father was an engineer very you know he wasn't very close down he was a very loving man but he basically sat down and the room filled up with green light and which happens sometimes usually it's more purple but it was with green light and then all of a sudden he goes whoa everything just turned green and I said to him, that happens sometimes. And he spent some time trying to figure out, he goes, oh, the light's coming in the window. And you know, then at the end, he sort of gave up on looking, but eventually he said, I don't know what you do, but I feel really good. So he didn't believe in it in some way, but I think everyone believes in it. A lot of times people talk to me about their kids or their parents, or, and they don't, they don't necessarily believe it. Uh, Sometimes people that believe it are the hardest to work with because they have a preconceived idea. And I say, well, no, you need to, it, even in your consciousness, you need to look over here. So a lot of times I am talking to people and it's just really to distract them while spiritually I'm doing something over here. And, but it's a tricky thing. And, but it's, well, it's more like what is their spiritual lesson? So again, I have stories. This woman... Um, she told me she hadn't slept for a full night in many years. I said, and I was married at the time. She was friends with my wife, and my office was in my house. I said, come there, be the last person you can sleep. There's a bed in that room. And so I knew I could get her to sleep, and she, I did the things I know that get people to sleep. She fell asleep. I left. She slept through the whole night. The next morning, she seemed fine, but after that, she was so angry at me. Like, and you'd think, wow, you know, so somehow it interfered with her process. So, you know, I don't know what that is, but, so that would be the karma or destiny, whatever you call it. Yes. We have to end right now. Okay. Uh, we're after 10 o'clock, but I want to thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Yeah. and doing and yeah. trying and wondering if I would ever get there and all of a sudden I was there quote unquote yeah. and everything you talk about I am, I do I have this really cool life even though other people would look at it and say how could you yeah. I adopted three kids when I was 57 oh, wow. I mean, you know, it's really wild but that's a great thing but so that don't do it in a overt way, yeah. but I'm taking care and helping a lot of people. Yeah, so your heart center is opening up. You mind if I touch you? But I need to, I need to... Well, some of it is, so in here, sort of like our, not our inner child, but a similar thing. So just, you can connect into there a little more. Oh, and we, we tend to not do that because emotions over. come up and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I do. These are my cards. Okay. So you can choose one. There's... There are the angel cards, so you get a, an angel word, and on the other side is my contact information. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Definitely yes. One question. Sure. Yes. The polarity sessions. Yes. How long are they in an idea cost? For someone I'm thinking about. Um, they normally last about 45 minutes. Okay. So I don't have a place where people come to see me, so it's a house call. So it's. Okay. So it's. $350, but usually on the phone, people can get what they want, and then that's 
if money, I mean, if money's not an issue, that's the thing to do. And so you, you honestly don't believe difference between in person. It's and different, but it's not necessarily better. Okay. All right. Okay. So 354 person to person, how much on the phone? It's by the minute, four dollars per minute, so 240 per hour. Okay. Thank yes. you. Yeah, if they're having problems, it's definitely yeah. I worth don't know it. if it'll be open, but it just made me think that you a never know. So you know, you it's surprising. Ask. You have to ask. So yeah, again, I always have stories, but someone. This one, I had an office in the city. She came, and I was treating her. I use these electronic devices sometimes, and she blacked out, and this negative stuff left her body, and she came to. She felt much better. But she came to me for the devices, and she didn't know about the spiritual part. And when I explained to her, it was just interesting that she was open to it because she didn't seem... Like my friend told me she had that out-of-body experience, and I would never... I'd go, really? Why, why didn't you tell me all these years ago? And I thought, so funny. So, you never know. You put it out no, there you and you see what it is. So, yeah, 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 thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. No, they're over here. Thank you very much. You're yes. welcome. Yes. Yes. I wasn't, but there are people do have colors around them. I don't always see that what people are talking about, but the colors are healing frequencies. Okay, well, that's that's like, yeah. Yes. All the colors of spectrum. Yes. What specifically did, um, green? Purple. Purple. Well, purple is usually for like more spiritual transforming stuff. Okay. Green is usually more for physical healing. Okay. But as I was saying, just if you're interested, keep those preconceived ideas back and wait. So, because the green could come in and be something different, and same with the purple. The funny thing is, I'm colorblind, so sometimes I don't know if it's blue or purple. Uh. And but sometimes the purple looks more you know, maroonish. Sometimes it looks bluish. So, so this it, one was essentially screwed up the side. What's that? Cycle, you know, so to speak. Well, I'm not sure what you mean. But she slept through the night. But, oh, that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, it was funny because she, she. So I was sort of in touch with her, but she was like, you know, wasn't friendly to me. She was friends with my wife, so I'd see her a little bit from time to time. But you'd think she'd be like, "Wow, I'm so happy!" Like, it's just a good example. Maybe she needed to get more um, no sleep. She wasn't she, ready to sleep. She needed to. That's the yeah. thing. So. Laura, thank well, that you. Could, Thank it's you. So nice, nice to meet you. Person. It is. Now I know what you look like. I don't yeah, know if that's that a good when I raised my hand, you know... Um, oh, I didn't see you. I, I was you hoping... Know, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. When you said if anyone else had a, um, that... Oh, I saw... Yes. And I was like, why did I do that? But you know what? We'll talk about it some other time. Okay. I didn't die. You but didn't die? That's good. You, I Thank wanted God. to bring it up because I thought it was a good Nice, Thank you very much. nice Thank to meet you. you. I'm glad to meet you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. I just wanted to ask you about something. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was always very healthy, and uh, then I went through a period of intense stress. Yeah. And um, I just had a triple bypass about four months ago, uh, and it was uh, extremely traumatic for me. And I, I well, there's things to clear. I mean, I can see this thing. So when you're saying you're hard, I'm not surprised actually. So. Um, and I still feel there's yeah. something going on. Okay. So something just sort of shifted. So and then you might actually start to feel some emotions going. So. There's the center is the thing. And again, I describe things in a vague way because, again, it's not always so concrete, but things are just balancing out for you. Yeah, if, if you're open to doing some work with me, it could help quite a lot. So. And, you know, then there's, I don't you have kids, I guess, probably. one child. Yeah. I feel like she's refused to be part of my healing. Okay, yeah. It's frustrating because I want her in my life, and yet she's away. Like How old is she? She's 31. Okay, yeah. So my son's 38, but around that age, he, I mean, we were, we've were we always been close. There was a few years around then that, I don't know if that's any consolation. But yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Yeah, you'll, you'll start to feel better. So in your, so your heart center is in the center of your chest that you might know, which is different than the physical. And so the energetically, it's in the center there. If you just check into there, and it'll help some of the emotions go. And, um, yeah, yeah, you have your diet. Some of your other organs are a little tired and stuff yeah, like that. So. Um, I always said I'm not a good candidate for Western medicine. Yeah. I don't really, I just 
doesn't. I don't trust it. And, I am and totally I'm, understand. It's so about money. And, yeah. Of, like, well, now you have to have this. Or you're well, going to it's not, that part. It's not necessarily bad. So I had a hip replacement maybe five or six years ago that I put up for a long time. And it just got to the point where, as soon as I woke up, it was like, oh my God, I'm so glad I did this. And you know, sometimes. Sometimes changing the things physically changes the karma spiritually. So. But there are things you could do to help you so. <laughs> Yes, and get clearer and different things. So yeah, there are things that are moving on. You're welcome. Well, sometimes when I work with people, they say, how do you, it's, there's no denying. I mean, when things, someone gets better, they get better. And, that's, and they say, how do you know it's not in their head? I go, well, it doesn't really matter. For